Afternoon, Greg. Um, it's sunny here in Birmingham. I know, I think, I know you're sitting in Edinburgh. I am, and it's also sunny here, so... Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Right, um, Greg, for those who don't know you, you took up a position within a very well-known business in the black country called HomeServe. Uh, and, and before I ask you what, what HomeServe did and do, let me just explain what the, what the financial papers were saying about HomeServe, which then led you to join them. So here we go. October 31st, 211, Financial Times, Shares of HomeServe have dropped by 28% because of alleged mis-selling concerns. HomeServe has suspended all telephone calls, sales, so that's all their marketing activity, because there's a fear that customers may not have fully understood the products that were being sold to them. The Guardian, same day, headlines, 450 million pounds wiped off, which reduced the valuation of the business HomeServe to 1.1 billion. Quote, home repairs group HomeServe saw 450 million pounds wiped off its market value as investors deserted the firm amid, amid fears its call center had been mis-selling products. It had to retrain all of its 500 call center staffs. Ofcom in July said HomeServe had breached its rules around silent abandoned calls. So, Mr. Greg Reed, how did you end up joining a business whose reputation was in tatters, its stock market valuation was plummeting? How did you end up at HomeServe? And tell me if I'm wrong here, you come from a finance background. That wasn't exactly the problems the financial papers were talking about. Uh, yeah, that's correct. My, my background was, was in, in retail banking. So uh, mostly credit cards and lending. So I was um, uh, up in Edinburgh, up at RBS um, when I got the call from HomeServe. And I guess the reason um, I went there and the reason they called me was that HomeServe um, is one of the few uh, companies uh, in the UK that you know, when it entered the FTSE 100 last year, um, its founder was still uh, the CEO. And he's a big important part of the company. And I think when um, the company had its issues, um, you know, he wasn't going to let that be kind of the final chapter uh, of the company that he started. And um, the board and, and the shareholders um, really just committed to, uh, okay, um, let's, let's admit if there were some issues and then let's try to turn a page on that. And I was really attracted to that um, idea that, <clears throat> um, you know, there was, there was a, a culture that needed to be fixed, that there was a, a transformation that needed to be happened, uh, needed to happen. And I was uh, brought in one of the first external uh, executive hires into the UK business. And, um, uh, you know, sp spent a few years before I was CEO working in that exec team for, for Martin Bennett. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a really uh, great experience. And um, yeah, they, they, there's a saying, uh, never waste a good crisis. And that was kind of the the situation I joined. But okay, so but, but the fi financial papers were saying there was a marketing issue, a sales issue. So was your role previously in finance, in finance, if that makes sense, or were you or were you from a background of marketing, which what which is what led you to this role? Yeah, so I um um Oh, well, <laughs> I've got a very background uh, in legal and finance um, uh, as a finance director, and then, and, but then I did move into marketing. And so at MBNA, um, I was the chief marketing officer for Europe. And um, what the FCA does when there are issues like this is they, they write a letter and, uh, you know, after a lot of analysis and they sort of say, here are some of the things that you need to do. Uh, and one of the things that they needed to do was to hire someone uh, who understood the regulatory environment uh, for marketing and sales. And that's, um, you know, why they went looking for me. Um, uh, MBNA was the largest direct marketing company in the UK uh, when I was running it back in the day, you know, 10 million pieces of mail a month, if you can imagine it, that makes me shiver now when I think about the environmental impact of that, but we, we weren't as open, aware back then. So, 
Yeah, I was I was brought into that um, that situation be, because of my skill set, um, uh, and and I was really a, once once I met the people at the company, um, I was convinced that there there wasn't anyone sitting in a room trying to missell, that it was uh, there were sort of issues of a lack of understanding of the regulation, and then and then that the culture was was geared the wrong way, and that you know you you could turn that around, and, and it was my first time working in in the black country and working in the Midlands. And, you know, when I met the people there, I thought, well, I couldn't find a better group of people to, to work with. So, so your previous role, was that in the UK? So you knew a bit about the UK culture and I know you, you talked about American bankers, RBS. So you did know a little bit about the English culture and, and the way yeah, that's I've been, I've been in the UK since the year 2000. So, um, okay. quite a long time. So about 12 years before I joined HomeServe, um, and um, we're, we're citizens and we're, we're proud to be UK citizens. Right, so that makes sense. So home server in trouble, um, financially they're in trouble, but the, the core problem for the financial problems was marketing. You come from a marketing background, you understood regulation, but you understood marketing per se. Uh, and, and of course, what the papers were saying back then was it was the way they were treating their customers and the way they were marketing to their customers. So. <clears throat> So you walk in, <laughs> you got this huge reputational problem, huge reputational problem. And Greg, I can tell you, uh, at that time, uh, you know, I was, I, was I? No, I was, I was just, I hadn't become president of the Black Country Chamber of Commerce, uh, but I was in the chamber. And I tell you, there was panic. There was panic in the business community that one of the biggest employers, HomeServe, was in trouble, was in real trouble. And I can tell you, that was definitely the feeling. So, so you walk in, and what do you decide? What, what do you decide to do with, with this backdrop of a collapsing business? How, what, what's your thinking? What's your thinking as you walk in? It was a strange environment, and I would say that one of the things that um, you know the the company um, hadn't been um, a good member of the community. Um, they'd grown, you know, and they were a good. They were an employer, but they hadn't really been a big part of the community. And 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 I felt that, and um, my communications team felt that because there was no outcry from say the black uh, country chamber of commerce or the express and star or the local MPs. There was no one saying, well, you've got it all wrong. You know, the, these mm -hmm. guys are great. It's really a really important part of the community. Everyone just kind of went, well, it would be bad to lose these jobs, but that was yeah. about, <laughs> that was about it. And so- um, I'm sorry, Greg, I think you're right. I've got to confirm what you've just said, completely right. It's more the economic implication rather than the community side. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and my, um, my, my boss in, in those early years, Martin, um, you know, we, we just sat down and said, how, how are we going to you know, get this country company turned around and going in the right direction? And um, you know, spent a lot of time in the beginning kind of mapping out, not the exact uh, p &L implications. I mean, the company was always very good at that. So we had a great finance team, but the sort of, uh, you know, what, what business are we in? And, and how, how are we going to do it? And why are we going to do it? And um, we even went on a little learning sabbatical um, uh, to, to different schools. Uh, uh, went to a, a, a new, new age business school called Hyper Island in Sweden. We went to Harvard for a week and, and, and we learned how to put together a strategy. And, and during those courses, we actually put together the strategy that um, through the time that I left in October for eight years had been our strategy. So you did some fact finding. How do you then strategies drawn up? How do you cascade what you're thinking, your vision, your strategy? How do you cascade it down so everybody in the business owns it? Because it's no point you just owning it. Nothing's mm -hmm. going to happen with it. So how did you set about cascading that strategy, getting people on board? Yeah, I think there's, um, this is an interesting part of the story, I think, because because my, my own natural style is to in, engage with as many people as possible. Even though I'm an introvert, I want everyone to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Um, and so from the moment I joined the company, that's sort of how I, I ran my team. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of communications for me. There was a lot of two-way communications, a lot of um, uh, one-to-ones, you know, I met, um, uh, 
everyone in my area, which uh, you know was was hundreds of people, uh, to, to try to talk to them about what we were trying to do. Martin loved that, and he and he ran with that as well. And we did our first sort of typical uh, leadership cascade, you know, where you have a the, the, the main leaders of the company. And we told them what we we were doing, and everyone seemed to like it. And then we said, well, let's just tell everybody. So we started having these events called cascades, where uh, to all 3,500 people, we would pull them off the phones or, you know, one, one year we had them at the NEC and we had um, three straight shows in a row of a thousand people. And, you know, we flew the guys down from Scotland and everyone came and, and, and the, the engineers and the call center people and the receptionists set with the lawyers and the finance guys and the marketing people in the audience and everyone it was sort of told what we were trying to do. And I think it's really important that um, everyone understands not only what you're trying to do, but how they fit into it. And that's what I really, really kind of stressed was I spent a lot of time talking to, to, to two engineers about engineers and, and, and really trying to listen to what their issues might be. And then, you know, uh, they don't always get what they want, but you could give them the context of in the, in the scheme of what we're doing. Uh, how all that works and fits together. So, so it was, you know, the cascading was a really important part of it. We, we put the strategy on a card, on one card, and we gave the card to everyone in the company. Um, and it even had our financial goals on it. Um, so, you know, we, we, we were out there as far as, um, you know, there was, no, there was no hiding from what we were trying to get done. Every, you know, didn't mean everyone bought into it, but everyone knew what it was. And then I had that really big desire to make sure that people understood how they fit into it. Did you find the markets were saying you were in trouble? Did you find the business knew it was in trouble? So as you walked in and talked to people, did they actually think the mm. business is in trouble? And didn't they th and did they realize why the business is in trouble? So in other words, were they as yeah. cognizant of the problems as you were? I think it depends on who you are. Like say Richard Harpin, he would know there were issues, but I don't think he was worried that the business was going to fail because he's so positive and confident and you know. It, 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 he's on the front foot on these things. I think the staff, when you saw, I think about 800 people lost their jobs across the company um, as it shrank. So people were very, very concerned about um, the job losses, um, worried about when we would start marketing again. Um, so people were worried. I, I used to, I always joke about this. When I joined, um, I, I said it was dark and it was, it was literally dark in the offices. Like they, they hadn't updated the lighting and it was, it was, it was dark and, 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 and I also think figuratively it was, and it was a scary time and there were lots of rumors. And so the more communication we could do, um, you know, the, the better it was. Um, and, you know, we haven't really talked about, but, but the first thing that I had to do and that Martin had to do was, you know, we had to make sure all the products worked because you, you couldn't bring the staff on that journey, that turnaround journey if they were selling something they didn't buy into or servicing something they didn't really believe in. And, and that wasn't down to people not doing their jobs. That was down to, you know, the people in the head office who designed the products wrong and, and gotten some things wrong and, and having to go out and fix those products so that they worked better. And, 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 and did you find in those early months, were there some real dark moments when you said to yourself as a leader, uh, people are looking to me here, um, but quite frankly, <laughs> this might be just a bit too much to turn around. Maybe I know, I know the entrepreneurial owner, founder thought, no, no, I will turn this around. But you from outside seeing these fresh eyes, did you ask yourself, oh, crikey, this may be just a bit too dark, maybe just a bit too difficult? Well, or did you think, no, no, we'll, we'll sort this out? Well, one thing that happened was I, you know, when I quit my cushy banking job and everyone sort of said to me, um, you know, you know, I was, I was in the, the headquarters of RBS. It was, it's, it's beautiful, you know, um, for all things that Fred did wrong, um, the head office was a nice place. So it was a nice place to work and, um, and, 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 and heading down to Walsall and, you know, in, in that little office on Green Lane, which is nothing wrong with it, but it was a different world. You know, and then I remember someone saying to me, I can't believe you're going to that grubby little company and, and me going, well, I think, you know, what they do is important. You know, they, they help people when they need help. It's a great business. And, and but that first week, there were rumors uh, in the financials about um, private equity 
taking the company out yeah. and private. Um, and, um, you know, my boss had to come to me and say, you know, Richard will, you know, will we'll never sell and don't worry about it. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not a problem, but it was, it was scary. And then the other thing that I did, um, you know, there's a guy, Patrick Lanconi, who wrote a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And, and in that book, it's a leadership fable, uh, a lady joins a company as CEO. And one of the first things she does is she, she tries to watch everyone as naturally as possible to try to understand what she had. So she didn't come in the first day and say, now here's the way we're doing things. She just started attending meetings and she just sort of watched who was, who was helping each other, who was on board, who were team players, who were out for themselves, you know, and, and she tried to let that natural environment go. And when I joined HomeServe, I did the same thing. You know, I was very calm. I watched what was going on around me. I was trying to make decisions on my management team. And um, I remember um, uh, one, of, one of the guys who, who's gone on to great success, Craig Foster, saying to me, I, I thought maybe you didn't understand how bad things were because you didn't just seem to all wash over you. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't seem to care. But I was just trying to get a feel for what I had and, and who was going to be, you know, as they say, on the bus and who, and who wasn't. Um, and it was a, a really important part of the, of the journey was, was that trying to understand it, you know, I can remember a meeting where one of the marketing directors uh, said it was good news that we hadn't spent all the marketing money and we were, we were giving it back and we were gonna have a, a, a favorable because we didn't have the expense. And I just said, look, you know, anyone who works for this CMO, we are not happy to get back money. <laughs> you, know, we, we, if we, you know, it's our job to come up with good things to spend it on. It, it, it's an utter failure for us just to hand back budget. Um, if you're a marketing department, um, you know, you don't want to waste money, but that wasn't, you know, you should be creative enough to come up with things to spend it on. So that was the kind of, you know, everyone was just a bit wounded. So crisis, uh, you go in early, you watch people. Now, was that just instinct or were you trained in leadership? Did you come from a background in leadership where you'd been through previous crisis? Because this was a crisis. Mm. But, but how, how, you know, what's the back? What's the thing that makes you drill through? Was it training, or was it just pure instinct to think, actually, this is the way I think I should lead? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've, I've had a lot of education in my life, and I've also had a lot of training, and I think all of that's important. Um, you know, in sort of uh, helping you be the person you are, and and different parts of that help with different things. So. So, 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 so my, my training as a lawyer really helps me to ask questions and to know when to say things and when not to say things and, and stuff like that. But I think the biggest thing um, is just watching the leaders that I admire, you know, whether it be my grandfather, you know, who wasn't a business leader, but was a leader to me, or, um, you know, the people when I was um, uh, junior coming up in my career and watching how they operated and, and actually picking out the ones where I thought, Wow, that you know that is something I'd like to be able to do one day. Well, you know, one thing in particular, I watched a leader one time get up and speak, and he, uh, you know, he kind of told a story, and that was back before it was popular uh, uh, storytelling. And I just thought, wow, that you know, I want to do that someday. That, that's how I want to be. Well, before we move on back to what you did in home, so just want to pick something up there. So, in in, in your view, then, <clears throat> from what you're saying, you learned the art of leadership from watching others. Do you think, do you think that's the case with everyone, or do you think that are actually born leaders, or do you think really is a case of training and watching and learning? I think, I think everyone is different, and so you know, it, it's never a waste of time to have some leadership training, you know, and 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 to hear some things. But I guess that the thing is, you know, I I didn't. You know, that person I mentioned, I didn't do everything the way he did it. I liked mm -hmm. that one bit. And I said, that, that would suit me, I think. And so I think that's what everyone needs to do. You know, you need to be authentic to yourself. And then, um, you know, and, and especially today, I think you, 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 you need to be authentic because people find that out pretty quickly if, uh, if it's a show or, if, you know, if it's not real. Same thing with companies, you know, if the, if the values are just behind the reception and they're not really in the culture, then there's no point to it. And it's the same thing with leaders, you know, who, who say like, oh, I really care about engagement, but then, you know, they don't do anything about it until the survey comes out and then they do a, you know, a quick little program and then they go back to business as usual. So back to home, sir. 
you've done your watching, you've done your monitoring, you've done your strategy, you start to cascade it down, you've invited all the staff to attend some sessions where it's been cascaded down. What next? What did you do next? And and you knew there was a culture change, just to me, in fact, you talked about the marketing spend. Yeah. Um, so how do you then change the culture? Because they've been used to doing things in a certain way, particularly around marketing and sales. And that was the big problem here. That was the big problem. And that was your task. So how did you then start to change the way people thought about those disciplines? Well, I think, you know, you, you tell people what you expect from them. And then, um, you know, as a leader, that's where communication is important. You, 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 you see examples and you, you raise up those examples and you sort of, you know, you say, I'm giving this person, you know, a bit of recognition because they've done this and this is what we want them to do. And that's, um, that's really cr critical. Um, and, and I think there's, there's probably two other things that in our journey that were they're really important. The, the fixing the products can't be overestimated. So you cannot, you know, take a product that isn't good and tell people you care about customers. You just can't do it. It's an impossibility. So, so, so right away we fixed all the products so that, you know, people, you know, had no doubt that what they were selling uh, worked as the customers expected and that they could sell it to their, their friends and family. And then the other thing is incentives. So this was uh, quite a controversial thing we did, but we removed almost all the incentives from the business. So um, sales and incentives in the call centers, you know, they, they all went five, six, seven years ago. And then also even incentives for the engineers, they used to get, you know, more money, the more jobs they did that type of thing. But it's really difficult to tell someone, I want you to take, the proper amount of time and make sure that customer is sorted. And then to also say, Bob, pay a little bit extra if you squeeze in another one. So, you know, that doesn't mean um, you don't want to be efficient. It just means that you need to then teach your managers to manage in a different way. So I always say the old way that HomeSurf had was called managing with spreadsheet. And you basically would just pull up your Excel spreadsheet and you'd say to someone, you're making less or you're making more, you need to do more, <laughs> you know, and then that leads to people doing things that, you know, aren't right. Not that they're bad people, but, you know, they're thinking, mm, you know, it must be okay. I don't know. No one's stopping me. And then you go to a balanced scorecard approach, which is, you know, how do I compare to everyone else? You know, and you include all the things like customer feedback and complaints. And so it's a really balanced, you know, and it's hard for someone to argue with you when they say, you know, I'm going as fast as I can. And you say, well, someone else has higher customer satisfaction, less complaints, and they're getting more work done. You know, what do we need to talk about to, 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 to improve what you're doing? Um, that's great. I remember I had an engineer who wrote to me and said it was really unfair because he had a, a 9.3 on his um, uh, ratings from customers out of 10, and, and he was in the red. And I just said, it's because the rest of your colleagues are averaging 9.7, you know, you know. <laughs> not good enough. <laughs> you, you, you need to pick up your game. You know, you're, 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 we're comparing you to other people, like you know, who are doing the same job as you. Um, and and in the law of big numbers, that works out over time. So I think getting the incentives out, um, fixing the products, uh, and then and then all the different communications were probably the key. And did you get resistance to these changes, particularly the one where potentially an engineer knew that if he did X number of jobs? He could pick up, and, and by the way, just just in case, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'll mention it, but HomeServe uh, will sort all your plumbing and all your home stuff if the things break. So, so that's what, when we say an engineer goes out, he fixes your plumbing or whatever it was, that's wrong in your house. So so how, how did engineers now suddenly feel that, oh, hold on, yeah, we can take our time, but actually our take-home pay is now less, or did you find a way around that? Well, what I would say, my, uh, my good friend, John Greaves, who I don't know if you've ever met him, who's been uh, at my side through, through uh, a couple of my executive stops, he has the saying, um, and, and he, he usually deals with the press, but his saying is always grab the moral high ground. So, you know, he basically says you can't get anything done if your response can then be challenged. And then the challenge leads you to do something else. You lose credibility right away. So with, with, with the removing the incentives, for the engineers, we, we grandfathered their incentive 
um, what on average they'd learned the, earned the previous year and gave it to them as a bonus that would be uh -huh. the next year. And, um, you know, of course that didn't make, you know, to me, that was hugely generous. It was like 5 million pounds and, you know, what a nice thing to do, but, you know, obviously some engineers were like, well, I was just getting ready to do more work. So I was going to make more, or I had a bad year last year. So you did, you know, you had to review it, but it, but initially everyone was in the exact same spot. Um, and, and in the call center, when we lowered the incentives, because they were, they were higher than we wanted to pay people for the work they were doing. They were, they were not, uh, they, they were just, the pay was out of whack. You know, they were, they were averaging in the forties and every other call centers in the twenties. So it just wasn't, the incentives were out of whack, which is one of the reasons the company got in trouble. So for those people, we did an 18 month gradual reduction in the average amount they'd been receiving and sort of said, look, we understand that you came to work and this is what people told you to do and you were making that money, but you're not going to be. And we also understand that you've got, you know, your life to get in order. So you've got kind of an 18 month gradual reduction to, to get things sorted um, because, you know, this doesn't make sense. It's not right. And it's going away. Wow. Extraordinary. Hmm. Right. So changes start to kick in. Engineers call center now starting to understand that the roles have slightly changed. How did you then monitor whether this change in strategy was working? And, you know, because there's, there's, there's the quantitative, and you talked about spreadsheets earlier. Mm. So was it a combination of spreadsheets and, and what else non-quantitative ways can you measure the changing of a culture? Yeah. Well, one of the big things we did was we, we did put in a program called Customer First, which um, encouraged people if you know, computers said no and they wanted to do it and they got to the end of the process, end of the call or end of the repair, they wanted to do something different. They could um, send an email in. We would look at it in the morning, tell them at nine what we were gonna do about it and get on with it. And I bring that in for monitoring uh, because you could really see once people engaged with that and, you know, uh, and saw that they could, you know, instead of feeling bad about leaving a customer you know, with an issue that, you know, and, and it, it wasn't the, you know, the FCA would have been fine with it because they weren't covered, you know? So, so say like, say they went to a, this is true. They went to a pensioner's house and um, he's got a, he's got a broken front window and he doesn't have the money to fix it. And they kind of fix the plumbing. And then they see this window and they ask him about it and he doesn't have the money. And so then they could, they could go in, ask for the money, HomeSurf would pay to get the window fixed. And then they would feel good about the company they work for. And I, re I bring that up as a monitoring because over time we had 25,000 of those. So you could see, you know, whether the staff were engaging, you know, with, with that, what is a pretty unique and, and extra bit of their job to, 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 to really help customers and to go that extra mile because they knew better because they were on the phones with them or they were in the house with them. Um, and so you, you could see all those things come through. The other thing that we did, um, was that we worked with a company called Rant and Rave, which is a, quite a big successful company. And a lot of people do this now, but we were one of their first big clients um, to capture customer feedback um, at the end of calls uh, and, and from the engineers. It's really common now. I know that I, I get requests and most of the time, honestly, I ignore them. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, we would capture a lot of data um, and we would capture it on the specific you know, um, agent. So, you know, that that went into you know uh, their their reviews of how they were doing was how their customers were say, saying they were doing and then would all roll up and everyone who did get a bonus a management bonus we all had those in, in our targets so I had the average of everyone you know and then you know d different execs would have you know the average of their areas um, and that and that was really really important um, to get that information and, and, and obviously use that information to also um, uh, make changes to the business and improve things um, as, as, as you went along. And then there's like the big, you know, I don't want to, you know, as an ex-finance director, I want to downplay the spreadsheets. You know, you can look at attrition, you know, and, and, and you can look at usage. Um, uh, you can look at response rates. So, you know, there's lots of the, those types of things you can see. But as a, as a CEO, the thing that I did that I think is unique is I never hid. So, and you know, you know that from social media, I was there to be found. If a customer wanted to yeah. find me, I was there and I didn't hide. And um, any customer who contacted me, 
I, I responded to them myself. Um, and, and I had someone in the office who had access to all the systems who could really see what was going on with the customer because, you know, I, I, I don't. Um, and um, so whether it was in Twitter, whether it was uh, an email, whether it was Facebook, you know, where, wherever. Um, and that was important, not, you know, I guess there's the, you know, you see it, you own it is the saying about, you know, working in a company, an issue, you know, and that's what I wanted my staff to know. If I saw an issue, I owned it and I finished it and I took care of it. And I wasn't too good to spend, you know, my time talking to that customer and, and in a very public forum, you know, I wouldn't tell them you got to go hide now. I'd finish it in Twitter. Um, and, you know, the staff would see that and think, well, you know, that's our attitude. That's how we do things. Someone's got a question, we answer it, you know, and we don't hide from it. And, and we do the best we can. And the number of times that someone, you know, they, they come on, people say horrible things in Twitter, you know, they, you know, and, and they would say, you know, you, you're disgusting and this disgusting company you're running and blah, blah, blah. And then I would come back and I would go, if you're saying a good person might've made a mistake, that's possible, what are the details? And then they'd be so nice. Oh, you know, <laughs> I always when they got it. You know, I, I remember that first statement you said, that was pretty tough, but um, they just don't expect anyone to respond. Um, you know, and so many times um, people went back and, and, and then they become your advocates. And if someone's beating on you, especially in Facebook, other customers will come in and say, hey, it's a good company. It's a good guy. You know, listen to what he's trying to say to get you help and get on with it. And, and I just wanted our people to see that. So just picking that up, I wasn't going to pick this, but I will now because you've just made a really, really good point. Now, in today's life of a very busy CEO or an exec, you know, they're, they're not sure that they should open up as you did on social media mm. and make yourself so available. Um, you clearly showed that it was worth doing and it obviously worked. So are, are you are, are you saying every CEO or certainly high-ranking exec should make themselves available because it shows that level of, again, the word you used earlier, authenticity, transparency, and an openness to listen would you would you say that everybody now in today's sort of social media driven should be looking to do that? Well, what what I would say is that when I first started, you know, and, and home service is so big, we do five thousand repairs a day. Um, that when I first started, it would have been hard to do that because I I, I would have you know there'd be too many people, mm -hmm. and so. And that didn't mean later we didn't make mistakes, but I knew later that we had the right attitude that if people saw something, they would do something. I think one of the best indicators of that is um, trading standards complaints. Before I arrived, they were getting 100 a month. And then lots of times the last year I was there, we either got zero or one. And that wasn't because we never made mistakes. That's because when we did make mistakes, someone dealt with it instead of letting it get to trading standards. And I think that's why, so like if I were, you know, uh, running another big company, and I know, I know some of these CEOs, I, you know, I would think twice about it because their service isn't quite there and it's not gonna be a great experience. And so I think once you sort of trust that, not that the service is perfect, but that people really care within the business, I think then you can open yourself up and you can show, uh, you can show um, a little bit more um, external face of, of the CEO to the business. Um, I don't see a lot of them doing it. And I, I, I always think, you know, if, if they trusted what was going on, they would do it. No, no, I, I, I think you're up to do it. And I, and I think what you said is right. Get the product and the process right. Mm -hmm. And then once you know the, the planks are in place, then you can go out knowing that you'll have a solution to any problem that comes in. Otherwise, you'll just get swamped. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, as a, as a CEO, um, you know, one of the things that comes with, the, you know, having the ability to, you know, to sit in a nice home like this and to have the life that I have is that you need to do, do that work and you need to set that example. And um, how you treat people is really important. So customers are really important and, and so are your, your people and so is anyone. So, you know, people sometimes wonder, um, you know, I got on my, uh, when I said I was leaving him, sir, when I posted my message in LinkedIn, I got a thousand comments. Yeah, and I, I didn't responded. see that. I responded I see that. every yeah. single, I responded to every single one because that's the polite thing you do. You know, that's, that's how you treat people. 
Um, now, obviously that's a once, you know, that doesn't happen to me that often, so I can do that. But, you know, that's, you know, you know how you treat that person, you know, so LinkedIn is a good example. Some, someone connects with you and they message you, you know, and they're trying to do the best they can. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're not a bad person. And you read it and you're like, that's crazy, you know, and you can either decide to ignore it or you can just come back and say, no, thank you. I'm not interested, you know, and show them a little dignity and get on with it. And how you treat that person who, you know, you, you will never get anything out of them personally, you know, will, will, will define you as a person with how you treat other people who might be a little more important to you. So the journey starts, you've cascaded it down, you've chained the metrics, how people have performed, how measured, how they're paid. How long did it take before you started to sense? And, and was it a non-quantitative way you sensed it or were the numbers telling you that actually this strategy is working? And how long did it take before you start to think, gosh, actually this thing is working? Well, it was in 14 was when we sort of, we, we stopped the, the we, you know, the J curve. So the business had been shrinking and in 14, we added customers and we went back up. So that was, that was a couple of years. So that was, that was important. As a, like, I think sometimes it's interesting because you, you, you use these metrics and you do all these things, but sometimes it's more about how something feels. And, and one, almost one year into it, we had, um, Halloween at home serve and we we had some sort of you know I sat with a little engagement team and I said let's do some contests of dressing the desks and best uh best costumes and we had one ride <laughs> in the car park and um it was I came in that day I was it was amazing it was like I was in a Disney attraction like the, just the costumes were crazy and and I it was that time that I just kind of felt oh, we're gonna make it this is you know people like each other that you know they, they care about each other they want to be here this is going to be something and we kind of over the years we turned that into a big you know every thanksgiving we fill the car park with carnival rides and they're free and the staff bring their family and but it was from that little you know that one little one where i just walked in that day and just saw one team they were dressed up as zombies and and you know like professional makeup i was like wow this is you know this is happening this is a uh... and so sometimes it's just about a feeling and and that was the feeling i had that i thought we were going to make it Wow. Now, you spoke about um, right at the outset, you said whilst people were worried about the impact of home serve on the local economy, you didn't really have that many stakeholders batting for you. So, so, so was that something you set about doing as well in the early days is looking at stakeholder engagement and getting involved uh, yeah. within the community? That, that must have been something you must have majored on because you spotted it. Uh, yeah. when you were there yeah there was um there was another company called cpp which had some issues and i remembered um you know their mps were were in the papers and everyone was banging you know and just talking about the importance of them to york and 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 i just you know john and i sat down with martin and we just said you know here's here's how we're going to engage with the community you know we're going to uh one help people uh do the things that they care about um we did the football sponsorship which was, you know, not about um, advertising because everyone in Walsall knows who we are, yeah. but it was more, it was more about, you know, that proud club and those proud people having a national brand on their shirts and, you know, the money that comes with that and the fixing up the stands and, you know, all those things. Um, so it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about, as I told like a million sponsorship people after that, it wasn't, you know, wasn't trying to, to get the brand out there. The brand was already in the community. I was trying to put the business in the community. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we sort of just started meeting with different MPs, meeting with the mayor. You know, I, it's probably how we, we came to know each other probably through me engaging in the local community with business leaders like yourself. Um, and honestly, um, you know, when people ask me to do things in the community that, you know, the number of, you know, times I've been to University of Birmingham and other places speaking, I've done it because, you know, we're, we're just trying to be a good citizen, good corporate citizen. Um, and then I'm, I'm really going over it quickly, but we, you know, the, the, the amount of money that HomeServe was willing to give the staff for them to do the things that they wanted to do in the community um, was, was significant. Um, and, and we did that because um, we didn't want to have like a big, the company before I joined had a big national charity that it supported. And it was a very much a business 
you know, relationship. We'd give them money. They'd give us their logo. And, you know, some people cared because they had a personal connection to that charity, but most people really didn't care at all. And so we tried to find things people cared about. So the best example is probably uh, MLSS. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna talk about that. That's how I also came across you through your connection with MLSS. Yeah, I mean, and that was just a you know those those guys came to me at work on Thanksgiving of, of all days and 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 talked about what uh, you know taught taught me about um, uh, Sikhs and you know what what uh, what what that's all about and about feeding others and helping the homeless and and then just sort of said, would you mind if we collected food here? And I just said, no, of course not, you know, and, and also how can we help? Because that sounds like a great thing. And um, so, you know, the people in Walsall over the years have donated tons and tons, literally tons of food, um, you know, and the company has, has helped with, with when, when things weren't quite as robust as they are now for those guys <laughs> with bands and things like that. When it yeah, made sure. it. And, um, you know, uh, I hope it's still going on, but for a long time went out on the Thursday night feeds and, and, you know, and, and gave the guys a break and, and, and sort of helped with the food. And, you know, and I, I did that because they, they cared and I wanted them to be able to care about the things they care about at work. And they told me that in the past, they'd been told that they weren't allowed to do it because it was a religious thing and it didn't really mix with work. And I never thought that angle it made no sense to me. You know, it was just, if that's what people care about and it's a good thing, let's get involved and let's do it. And then the reason it was so successful is because, you know, those guys, uh, Pops and the others really cared so much uh, that people wanted to help them. And so they did bring in the food, you know, I could, you know, it's one of those things you just can't believe year after year, they kept bringing in food, you know, they never forgot. And I would always see those big uh, baskets by the doors filled uh, with stuff. So pretty incredible. Uh, for those, those of you not familiar, MLSS, uh, serve food for those who are disadvantaged they take the food out to them and and i must concede um when i saw the connection with home serve my impression of the brand home serve changed instantly because i thought wow they're actually in the community so i think that was a great one uh, just an example of the sort of corporate responsibility that turned around the home serve brand so okay so everything's going well did you find it and you you, you mentioned this earlier um that the business whilst it was floated on the stock market it was a FTSE 250 16 percent of its ownership and its entrepreneurial drive was still with its founder how did you find when you walked in convincing somebody and you mentioned that he was very positive and i mean that probably helps yeah did he, did he just say, yeah, just go with it, just sort it, because this needs sorting, or was a bit, or, or did you have to manage him as well, if that makes sense, on the board, and then expect it, particularly as you went to CEO, because they'd be looking for you then to be resolving everything, rather than just the marketing. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I mean, Richard, you know, home service is part of him. You know yeah. that, that you know he, he he it's so important to him and to who he is and to what he's trying to achieve and so he's you know always there but he's also very empowering you know he was not i didn't have to go to him and ask can i do this or do that or you know even when i was cmo uh he i would meet with him because he's you know he's obviously a brilliant marketer which is how i got the company going and you know and he would show me sort of here's what we did in 1993 if, you know to, to try to give me the history of things so I could try some new things that maybe were old things. Um, yep. you know, and he's always uh, thinking of new ways to do things. And so he's, he's, he's very energetic. Um, and you know, if you're him, having a, 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 a business that is um, where, you know, where the FCA is happy and customers are happy and the staff are happy, as long as you're hitting the numbers, then there's no real downside to that. It's all, it's all upside. Um, and I think if, you know, being really, really honest, you know, if, if, if there's anything that Richard would want, have wanted me to do more of, it would have been to be more entrepreneurial and to try more new products and to try more new things that, you know, pr probably, and, and I, I know this about me, I'm more of a let's fix the thing that's broken, let's get this working well, 
you know, let, let's, you know, we can, we can try, we can add that, but I don't really want to do something that would risk uh, our service standards by anything too crazy. Um, you know, so that, that, that's where, if there was ever any rub, that's, that's where it would be. Um, but that was fine. And, you know, I, I kind of, I liked that push. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from him. The, 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 the energy and the drive of someone to, to be in the same company and to drive it, um, you know, all the way from founding it into the, you know, into the FTSE 100 and then now back out again for some reason, even though nothing happened with the company, weird, <laughs> but <laughs> back out again um, uh, because everyone's delusional and thinks this Brexit or this, uh, everything in the future is going to be fine in the stock market for some reason. But um, yeah, it, is, it was incredible. And, and his, just his drive, you know, just the, one of the things that uh, very early on, um, he asked me to do something and I went back and I asked one of the guys on my team to look at this and they said, oh, he asked about that last year. We already had that discussion. And at the time I kind of thought, that's not right. But what it is, is he doesn't give up. He thinks there's something there and he's going to make it, you know, he, he's going to keep driving at it until he's satisfied there's, there's nothing to drive at. So it's not that he didn't remember they'd already looked at it. He just wasn't quite happy with, with the outcome. And, and sometimes I would say uh, the guy said they did that and he said, I'm not sure we did it right. So, you know, nothing wrong with that attitude. And, and, and as you were going on this journey, um, and then just a couple of questions before we wrap up, what did success look like for you? How did you know that when I leave, whenever I leave, I want to achieve this? What, what, what was that? I know it was a low base to start from because mm. you're in big trouble. Mm. But did, did you have you know, at the outset, what does that success look like for you? And there's a reason asking that question. Well, I had, uh, so I think we, we had, when we did the strategy, we, we identified the things that were kind of like the big targets that we wanted to get to. So there was a, there was a, it's a business. So there was a profit target. There was an engagement target there, you know, there was a customer satisfaction target. And so those, those things were important to me. I think what, you know, as far as when my time, you know, came to an end, the thing that, people would always say to me, uh, you know, what, you know, cause we had so many case studies and people come in and talk to us and about the turnaround, even the FCA had me go speak at an event, you know, so there's a lot of, of looking at what we're doing. And then they, the question would inevitably come, what happens when you go? Yeah. And, and um, you know, and to, so to me, that's success that I know there is a group of people there who, you know, care about the customer and care about each other. Um, you know, and, and they will, you know, and they're very commercial, so they're driven to hit numbers. Um, but, you know, they also want to do it the right way, which is harder, but more satisfying in the end. So to me, that was, I think that was success that um, I felt things would carry on. Also, that kind of, um, you know, I think I will go get another exec job sometime in the future. I don't know, I'm doing some charity stuff now, and I'm enjoying all that, but I probably will. But you know, success for me is that I can just say, call, call anyone. Just pick a random person and ask them. <laughs> so the reason I asked that question, because you had two big stakeholders, potentially three. So at the outset, what success looks like. There's the founder, you then had the board, and you had the chair, mm -hmm. as well as all the other stakeholders. So it was important that you understood what success looks like but equally that chimed mm. with what those stakeholders also thought. And so which way was it? Did you then go in and say, well, I'm now CEO. I was marketing, but I'm now CEO. This is what success looks like to me. Is that how you approached the board and the chair and Richard and say, you know, this is what we've done up to now. And this is what I think success should now look like. Well, I think with any stakeholders like that, um, you know, I guess I think you would drive yourself insane if you tried to uh, make sure that they were all completely aligned. It just they have different things that they care about. And so my uh, board of the UK business, you know, they, they were very concerned about the FCA and risk, whereas the PLC board, they're concerned about that. But they were like, that's your day job. What are you doing on top of that? You know, you know that's that's the minimum standard. Whereas the the the, the, the local board was obsessed with the risk. You know, so you just have different people, and when you would speak to them, you would speak about different things. 
And I always, you know, I have that saying from JW Marriott that if you, if you look after your people, they'll look after the customers and the rest takes care of itself. So those are my stakeholders, you know, the people, the customers, and the rest takes care of itself are those stakeholders and the financials and all of that stuff, you know? And so you have to really get all that, you know, you kind of gloss over that with the rest takes care of itself, but that is actually where a lot of the work is. And then if you can get all that set up properly and then unleash the people on it, you know, you've got a good chance of success. And then what the result will be is maybe there'll be a big commercial success, which, you know, HomeServe went from, the share price went from 157 to, it was uh, 1356 or something when I left. So, you know, that was a good result. That's um, a good result. You know, and you mentioned 1.2 billion. There was, there was a, you know, time when it was over 5 billion. So, you know, a huge, huge run, not, not, you know, it's a global company, so lots of people involved in that. But the UK business, if you know, the UK business was half the business in the beginning, if, if that went in the tank, then none of that would have happened. So, you know, commercially it was success. We won all these awards. I won that nice award um, for Glassdoor for uh, number four rated CEO in the, in the lockdown. That was really nice. Of all the things, you know, sometimes people say money or whatever, just that my people rated me that highly for an award that I didn't know existed, that just all of a sudden, <laughs> I get a, you know, in my, in my Google feed, it's mentioning me and my wife is like, Hey, my friend who works in HR got a thing about you that you're, you know, and that, that was just really, really nice. And that was all those things, you know, a, a, an accumulation of all those things they talked about being authentic the communication, you know, and that helped you manage through that lockdown, um, the first lockdown, which was scary. Um, it came out of it fine. So, so to me, that's another indication that it went okay. So, so, so let me now ask you the final question. Fascinating, uh, fascinating. So, managing in a crisis, you walked into one, then you lived one through the lockdown. What three things would you say to CEOs or senior execs, and you've been through two, maybe ones earlier as well, what advice would you give them? Three things that they should think about in a crisis that involves probably ultimately some kind of turnaround. But what sort of three things finally would you say to someone how to manage in a crisis? Yeah, well, I guess um, I would say that, you, you know, to, to manage in the crisis, so, so managing in that lockdown period um, and, and I'm gonna say doing well, you know, it's such a horrible thing for society, but you know, the, the, the business did all right. And our people were, were, were good. Um, that all started a long time ago. So what I would say is if, you know, you're going to manage in a crisis, there's two different types, you know, there's one that you're there and the crisis comes. And so managing through lockdown was a lot of work, but I didn't have to beg people to do what I wanted. You know, they already trusted the management team. Mm. They knew we cared about them. You know, they, they knew that, you know, we, we had an open culture that, you know, engineers could ask questions about their safety and no one would say a thing, you know, we'd be happy about it. And so all that was kind of, you know, the, the previous uh, five years of building the culture really paid off in that moment. The other time it paid off was in, you know, the big, in, in store memo, it paid off big time too, because, you know, pe people kept going when other companies shut down. We, we never shut down, we just kept going. Um, I was in Walsall on the weekend and I walked to work because like it was too bad to drive. And I got to the car park, I was full of cars. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. You know, that people, they did it. You know, they, you know, when, when the customers needed them, they, they turned up. And then when I got in there, it was not just the call center staff, it was the managers, the canteen, everybody in the company had turned up to, to make it go. So you, you, you know, and then, and then I think the sort of, the kind of crisis when you step in the crisis, I guess, I don't know if I've got three things, but the, you know, Okay. I think you need to understand what the end game is, you know, and then, then you need to make some short-term decisions to, to make sure you don't fall over. And, and then you need to do a lot of just listening and, and learning initially but before you start sort of saying, uh, you know, this is what we're going to do. You, you, you better understand what's going on um, if, if, if you want people to do it. Greg, that's been fascinating. <laughs> really fascinating, fascinating insights, and um, yeah, I can't wait to do the intro and the and the and the outro on this. There's so much I want to listen to it again. But thank you very much. You were uh, I've seen you speak a number of times, and you you were brilliant. And and I knew it was just a case of connecting the dots and getting you. You were a brilliant speaker at my events, and I just know there was so much value in what you said. 
And it was really pertinent to me because the company you turned around was at our doorstep. Yeah. And I know, I know the crisis that it was engulfed. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting. It's, yeah. And it's really natural for me to, when you say that, to say we turned it around. You know, that, that is, that is a part of me as a leader. You know, it's not me, it was we. And, you know, it was a big old team effort. Um, and and I, I know I was an important part of it, but, you know, it, 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 it took a, a lot of people to turn, turn things around. Well, Greg, the sun is still shining here. I think it's still shining where you are. It so is. I'm going to say thank you very much for taking that time. Uh, you wrote a brilliant piece in the Business Influencer. And I know for a fact, and hopefully your copy will arrive any day, and I know for a fact we'll be turning back to you again because oh. you have such wisdom <laughs> and such great experience. It'd be terrible for us not to grab some of it in future podcasts and future uh, articles. Greg, thank you very much for your time. Mm.